Victory Studios in downtown Little Rock. This is Capital View. Good Sunday morning to you and welcome to Capital View. I'm Kate Renee Saff. One hot button issue in Arkansas right now, teacher pay, came to a boiling point this week at the state capitol. On Thursday, the Arkansas Legislative Council voted to rescind its approval of $500 million in spending for the state education department. That money recommended to be used to give full time teachers a $5,000 bonus and a $2,500 bonus to full time staff. It would come from elementary and secondary school emergency relief funds. It's not a vote thousands of teachers in the state were hoping for. This morning, Arkansas Education Association President Carol Fleming and State Representative David Ray join us to talk more about this vote and where exactly we stand. First of all, thank you so much for joining us today to discuss this. I know teacher pay has kind of been a hot button issue for a little bit now, so we tackled it a little bit, but why now are we talking about this? Well, the proposal that is currently being debated uh, was announced by the governor in a press conference, and uh, his intention was to put this into a special session. And, of course, there's broad support uh, in the legislature for raising teacher pay, especially within our Republican caucus. Um, but the specifics of when and how to implement it and execute those increases, that's the, the whether it's in a special session or in a general session in January, that's sort of what's being debated right now and uh, the, all, the source of all the kerfuffle at the Capitol this week. All the kerfuffle, of course. And, and, you know, Carol, as we're talking about teacher pay, I know that for the Education Association, that's kind of a, a big issue for you guys as well. It's a very big issue. And, um, yes, it was brought up with the governor during a press conference that he wanted to raise the salaries. He had proposed $46,000, and then he backed it down to $42,000 because we have a $1.6 billion surplus. And this is the time to be able to put that money, invest it in our schools, invest it in our students by raising the salaries of our educators. We rank 49th in the United States. Arizona is the only state that is behind us, and we are dead last in our region. And I want to touch on, you both mentioned the governor as well. He actually issued a statement on this. He said in a release, quote, uh, I am concerned that teachers in some districts will not get a bonus, but others may not. The creative approach by the committee today, while well-intentioned, is not the best approach to helping our teachers. So both of you, what is your reaction to that? I'm going to start with you, David. Well, let me go back and say there is broad support in the legislature for increasing teacher pay, especially within our Republican caucus. You've seen uh, under Republican leadership the last seven years, each and every year, we've increased the minimum starting teacher pay. Uh, that is on the heels of almost a decade under Democrat leadership where the minimum starting teacher salary stayed stagnant, almost flat. Um, listen, uh, we support raising teacher pay because we understand, we appreciate, we revere the important and often life-changing work that our teachers do in the classroom each and every day. I have a daughter that starts kindergarten here in just a couple of weeks, and so this issue's been at the forefront of my mind for quite some time. But the, the debate is over when is it most prudent to execute the, the teacher raise plans, and there's a lot of reasons that it makes more sense to do this in a general session rather than a special. You know, first of all, um, the plan that has been proposed has a multi, uh, uh, several hundred million dollar price tag, and to the best of the best that I can tell, they're asking us to pay for that with one-time funds. Obviously, increasing teacher pay is a permanent spending commitment, and so you don't want to do that with one-time funds because, generally speaking, that's not fiscally responsible to do. Uh, secondly, most economists uh, believe that the Biden economy is careening toward a recession, and if that's the case, then we're likely going to have state revenues severely impacted by that. And six months from now, when we go into a general session, we're going to have a much clearer view of what the economic outlook looks like across the state. We're going to have a much clearer uh, view of the revenue situation and picture. And third, we're in the middle of an adequacy study right now. And the Senate Education Committee and the House Education Committee are working hard to address this issue. Teacher pay is a huge component of that, but not just teacher pay, there's also uh, school bus drivers, school nurses, paraprofessionals, all that deserve a raise, and we want to make sure that what we do 
is inclusive of all of our school employees and benefits everyone and that we do it in a way that's fiscally sustainable. Okay, and Carol, do you feel like now is the right time or does it need to be studied a bit more? No, the study has already occurred and the legislature received that study back in April. They have that data and raising the salary of our educators right now when we do have the surplus funds does not take away the work of the legislature in putting forth that adequacy study and putting funding into place once they have reviewed it, although they've had it since April. I know they're going to come back in the next general session and actually look at putting it in place, but we have the money now. We are second to last in the nation. We are last in the region. A one-time bonus does not pay the bills moving forward. A one-time bonus does not put money into our retirement system. That we as educators, we actually invest in our retirement. But giving us a one-time bonus is not going to help us with our retirement. And it also is not going to help to recruit and retain highly qualified, certified educators in our schools. We have a critical shortage right now with educators. I have noted that in the past, this past session or this past school year, we had some school districts that had to pivot to the virtual learning because they did not have enough school, enough school bus drivers to pick up the kids and take them to school. So they had to pivot to online learning. So we have a critical shortage all throughout the state with all of our educators. This is an opportunity to recruit and retain and show the state of Arkansas that we have value in our education system, we value our educators and we value our students who are our most precious commodity by ensuring that they have certified, highly qualified and paid a living wage educators. Well, I certainly understand the desire to want to take immediate action. And that's why I think that's what you saw this week at the Capitol when the Legislative Council took action, sent a very clear message that we want the funds that have come to Arkansas through fr from Washington DC through the ESSER funds to be utilized significantly and substantially for the purpose of bonusing our teachers of supporting them and their compensation uh, making sure that they do see immediate relief um, and that's on the heels of what we did last session when we shored up the public school insurance fund we invested significantly in that and as you saw in the news this week, we're starting to see the results of that where premiums are projected to actually decrease. So we're continuing to take action to, uh, to help and support our teachers because of the important work that they do. And like I said, I fully anticipate that the next time we get into a general session, we're going to continue the work that we've done for the past several years of raising teacher pay. And that's all well and good. However, waiting until the next general session and then waiting for the fiscal session when you actually determine where that money goes, that keeps us second to last in the nation and last in this region for another two years. That's why we need to do this now. While I appreciate the fact that we have addressed the health care issue because that was a daunting issue because there was no reason that public educators should be paying more for their health care insurance premiums than our state employees when we all have the same health care. So that was great. But yet now we have to take a look at the salaries of our educators. And as I have said, a one-time bonus is a one-time bonus. Mm -hmm. Additionally, those ESSER funds those ESSER funds have been dispersed for the past couple of years as a result of COVID. And many of our school districts, they had the latitude to use those monies to, um, to address learning loss. They also were able to invest that money in improving their, um, their heating and air, their ventilation systems, and also allowing students to have increased technology. So to highly recommend 
and that's what the motion was yesterday to highly recommend a five thousand dollar bonus to certified staff and twenty five hundred dollars to classified staff and then part-time staff receive half of what a full-time staff member makes that is only a one-time bonus it does not address the fact that we still need to recruit and retain and coming back to the fact that these school districts may have already utilized their ESSER funds, then you're going to find that there are school districts throughout the state that will not be able to provide this one-time bonus that the legislature and the governor has said that they have overreached their authority on this, that um, the legislature the legislature is only highly recommending it and then they want to oversee the plan and approve the district plans to do this so then that's taking away local authority which we always say it should be the local school district that makes the decisions for their school district for their community and what is best for the students in their schools and their communities and this of course has been a, a, a hot topic in Arkansas for some time and of course right now it, it's is a hot topic and will continue to be for some time. Thank you so much for both of you for joining us today on Capitol View. Of course, we're going to have a lot more coverage on our website as well with previous stories we've covered with the Arkansas teacher pay issue. we got a lot more coming up next. A new and improved way to help those with the mental health crisis with the push of just three buttons. This Sunday, you're watching Capitol View. Big Care Medical Center provides Welcome back. 988. It's the nation's first national government supported mental health crisis hotline. It's been up and running for a few weeks now. The no, new number is part of a $400 million investment by the Biden administration to beef up crisis centers and other mental health services. We're joined now by Jacob Smith with the Par Department of Health. He's going to talk about how exactly this hotline works and how it's offering further support for mental health in Arkansas. Jacob, thank you so much for joining us today. I want to start by asking this 988. 8, 8 number. How is this different or similar to what we've already had? So with the 988 rollout, the number is the same in the fact of you can contact 988 or 1-800-273-TALK. The services are going to stay the same throughout and it's just an easier way to remember um, emotional resource and emotional distress hotline. And so when we say easier, when we're talking about a three-digit number versus a 10-digit number, uh, you know, is the hope that this will just allow more people to be able to call in? Correct. Um, make it to where it's easier to call in, easier to remember. And with the overall goal of having someone to call, someone to respond, and somewhere to go with standing up uh, mobile crisis units and uh, crisis stabilization units as well in the future. Um, currently with crisis mobile crisis units, they are there's two pilot programs throughout the state and those are located in the Fort Smith area and the Northeast uh, Arkansas region to be able to help Arkansans in their crisis. And when we talk about these crisis centers, I think uh, one of the main questions has been what happens when you call this number? What types of resources are offered? So if someone were to dial 988 in a crisis, what can they expect? So it's going to be, uh, they're open 24 hours a day. It's free confidential services. You can contact if it be uh, financial stressors, uh, marital issues, family issues. We will locate resources that are caller driven. Um, if anybody needs therapy, if somebody just needs a lending ear, the lifelines are available day or night. And has there been any response from this week that it's been operational? Are we seeing more people utilizing these services? Yes, uh, for the so, uh, July 16th, it rolled out and 988 became, uh, it went live, so to speak. And since then, we have seen an increase in calls in our call center of about 20, 20 calls per day increase compared to what it was say one week ago. And a lot of the calls, so, well, not a lot of them, some of them are just wanting to know what the number is, what type of resources we provide and what kind of care we can give callers. 
And Jacob, I know here in Arkansas, of course, it's different than the nation as a whole in terms of what specifically we're looking at. Uh, when we talk about mental health crises here in Arkansas, is there anything unique about the state that could uh, better inform these resources? So Arkansas is a, a small state per capita. Um, and currently we have three call centers that are stood up throughout the, the state. And being able to work together in a cohesive message and be able to deliver quality resources to Arkansans at the end of the day will be able to help the entire state. All right, Jacob Smith with the Department of Health, thank you so much for joining us today on Capital View. We're going to have more information on this on our website as well. And coming up next, Arkansas schools decide on taking steps to better protect students. How one district is turning to more school resource officers. Morning talk focused on the political scene in Arkansas. With students going back to school in a few weeks, parents around the state have concerns about safety. Many school districts are reevaluating their safety plan and their number of school resource officers. Russellville is just one of those districts. Niels Rang has more on the city council's decision to add more security to campuses. How we want to ensure that we don't have the same failure in Russell that occurred in Raleigh, Texas. Mayor Richard Harris recounted the failures that contributed to May's deadly Robb Elementary mass shooting before taking a vote in hopes to protect the city's children. Well, I definitely think it brought it home. Mark Tripp's wife teaches fourth grade and they have a child entering kindergarten this year. He's also on the city council which voted unanimously to fund a school resource officer for all four elementary schools inside the city limits. The money's there, the resources are there, we just have to make it a priority. Russellville is funding the SROs for one school year with $160,000 left over from 2021's general fund, but they anticipate the school will help fund the partnership in the future. With the decision, each school in the district will have its own SRO. A feed most recent statistics show only one in five Arkansas school districts have achieved. At the end of the day, the biggest uh, concern are of parents is their safety in the school. And, and the second, you know, is their education, but they want to know uh, that, you know, their kids are safe. Again, that was Neil Zarang reporting. According to the Arkansas School Safety Commission, there are currently 460 school resource officers in the state's 223 districts. 84% of school districts have armed presence on campus, but only 20% of our school districts have a school resource officer on all campuses. The School Safety Commission meets again on Tuesday. The Arkansas Legislative Council has approved $1 million in grants for organizations helping expectant mothers with unwanted pregnancies. Scott Harden with the Arkansas Department of Finance and Administration says this means the DFA will now have authority to give money to applicants. Those applicants can range from pregnancy resource centers to adoption and foster agencies. Anyone who's able to prove they're helping eligible women. We've heard from them that the groups that are just tracking this and interested to know when they can actually apply. Uh, so I know they'll be tracking very closely today what happened in the legislature. Hardin anticipates about 40 to 50 different organizations will be eligible for this funding. He says applications should be posted online by the Department of Finance within the next few weeks. Anyone who receives part of the grant has to spend it by June 30th of next year. Nationally, members of the January 6th committee accusing former President Trump of violating his oath of office when a mob of his supporters attacked the Capitol. The accusal comes in the committee's eighth hearing, which focused on what the president was doing when the attack was happening. NBC's Chris Pallone has the latest. Through live and taped testimony, the House Committee investigating the January 6th Capitol attack painted a portrait of a president who resisted calls to take action to stop the siege for more than three hours. To me, that's a deliberate choice that he's not acting because that's part of the plan. Witnesses said the president was content instead to watch the insurrection unfold on television in a West Wing dining room. Count me among those who was uh, hoping to see an unequivocal, strong statement uh, clearing out the Capitol. Testimony revealed Mr. Trump was calling senators, urging them to delay the electoral vote count, all while rebuffing attempts from staff and even family members to get him to condemn the attack. Thinking that the president needed to tell people to go home, who, who would you put in that category? I, I would put uh, Pat Philbin, 
Eric Hirschman, overall Mark Meadows, Ivanka, once Jared got there, Jared, General Kellogg. The committee emphasized the terror felt at the Capitol that day, showing Missouri Senator Josh Hawley running from the mob. Clear, we're coming out now, all right? Make a way. An anonymous White House security official said Secret Service members with Vice President Pence feared for their lives. There were calls to um, say goodbye to family members, so on and so forth. A former White House spokesperson said the president only exacerbated the crisis with a tweet. Pouring gasoline on the fire and making it much worse. The committee also showed outtakes from a video shot the day after the attack where the defeated president refused to acknowledge his election loss. I don't want to say the election's over. While the committee can't charge anyone with a crime, it can make a criminal referral to the Justice Department. I think the, the president certainly has criminal exposure. The committee trying to make the case Mr. Trump was derelict in carrying out his duty as president. We solved a mystery tonight, I would say. Here was the, the president who didn't act. And that was the key to solving this case. And is unfit to hold office ever again. The committee said it will hold more public hearings in September to go over new evidence and to issue its final report. In Washington, Chris Pallone, NBC News. Also in Washington, former President Trump advisor Steve Bannon found guilty of contempt of Congress. The decision Friday comes after Bannon defied a subpoena from the House Select Committee investigating the January 6th attack. Bannon faces a minimum sentence of 30 days behind bars or up to one year. He could also be fined between $100,000 and $100,000. And President Joe Biden continuing to work from the White House on Friday following testing positive for COVID-19. Despite the positive test, Biden resumed his duties, including speaking by phone with his national security team. According to the president's physician, Biden is still experiencing a runny nose, fatigue, and the occasional cough, although his temperature, blood pressure, and respiratory rate is all normal. The president has responded well to treatment and is expected to make a full recovery. Biden is both vaccinated and boosted against the virus. Well, stick around. You're watching Capital View on Sunday morning. We'll be right back. Political scene in Arkansas. Well, that's it for Capital View on Sunday morning. Thank you so much for watching. We're going to be back with an all new Capital View next week with all the updates. Enjoy the rest of your weekend.